Black, we're going to call the November 3rd Board of Education meeting to order. Uh, please, Wanda. Robert Hamilton. Here. Quentin Harmon. Here. Chuck Landers. Here. Steve Rogers. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We want to welcome everybody who's here in person and all those people watching. Uh, I would like to say at this point that Dr. Bug is not able to be with us tonight. He is out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, dealing with a very ill daughter, and we certainly excuse him in those, under those circumstances. So we wish him well, and we wish Megan well, too. Okay, with that said, uh, are there any communications from the floor in regard to agenda items or anything in general? I think we have, first of all, these two gentlemen who would like to make some comments to the board. So go ahead, Rich or Jeff, whatever everyone wants to start. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, I'm Rick Barnard, a uh, retired pastor for Morris. Uh, and, uh, my retirement occupation is substitute teacher, teacher uh, schools all over the county, including <laughs> Cove City Schools, which I have very good experiences at. Uh, what, what, uh, what we're concerned about is this law that was passed, Senate Bill 818, uh, this past spring and signed by the Governor Christner on August 20th. And what it specifically does is it uh, requires uh, any, any school that has any kind of sex education to conform with these standards, which are the national sex education standards. And so this is our understanding after talking to Senate, state senators and so forth, this is our understanding of the bill. In other words, any sex education that's taught in the schools must comply with these standards. But the good thing is they said that school boards can opt out. But unfortunately what they say is if you teach any sex at all, you have to use these, any sex education at all, essentially you have to use these standards. Um, Anyway, and I handed out the documents. It refers to the law itself, the link, and also to the National Sex Education Standards. What it does, what this law does, is it ties in to the second edition of the National Sex Education Standards, uh, which is a national thing sponsored by different organizations uh, that are very much promoting the LGBT agenda, uh, as well as Planned Parenthood is also involved in this too. If you go, anyway, if you go, you'll find the whole, all the standards. We just highlighted some of the things that we're concerned about starting in grades K through 12, uh, K through, K, I mean, K through two. By the second, by the end of second grade, the students should be able to define gender, gender identity. And they define gender identity as how an individual identifies based on their internal understanding of their gender. Gender identity may include male, female, agender, other nihilist, gender queer, non bio trans, transgender, and many others or combination thereof. We feel that. We should not, we should, this is something that parents should talk about, not something that schools should be talking about, especially starting in second grade about if you choose your own gender. Uh, and then, but you can read through it. Uh, by, by the end of fifth grade, they had to uh, be able to explain about romantic sexual feelings, masturbation, so on. Uh, they have to know about the potential role of hormone blockers and young people who identify as transgender. Uh, they have to know the distinction between sex assigned at birth and gender identities, uh, and further inform you can see some more in there. Uh, they have to also uh, define sexual orientation on the second page now. Sexual orientation. These definitions are from the glossary of the National Sex Education Standards. Sex orientation, a person's romantic, emotional, and or sexual attraction to other people. Sexual orientation include, but are not limited to, asexual, bisexual, gay, heterosexual, lesbian, Pansexual and queer, uh, and differentiate between sexual orientation and gender identity. That's by fifth grade. By eighth grade, uh, they have to again explain all these things about sexual orientation, all these different things. They have to also define vaginal, oral, and anal sex by eighth grade. Also, <laughs> have to know about abortion, pregnancy options. Uh, and if you skip one down, they even have to develop a plan for the school to promote dignity and respect for all, for people of all gender, gender identity, gender expressions in the school community. And then they also have to develop, develop a plan for, to promote dignity and respect for people of all sexual orientations in the school community. And since this is also a high school district, uh, it's a unit district, uh, they go on into ninth and 10th grade, 
of course, it's some of the same stuff uh, as they have to know by eighth grade. Uh, they have to be able to define reproductive justice, which is interesting. The philosopher said this is a term coined by 12 black, black women to define human rights and maintain personal bodily autonomy. I think that means essentially abortion. They want to abort. Also, gender freedom. It comes under that reproductive justice. Uh, and then if you go on to the flat grades 12, which I don't know whatever page they're on now, uh, they have to be advocates for school and community policies and programs that promote dignity and respect for people of all gender, gender expressions, and gender identities, and sexual orientations. An advocate for school and community policies and programs that promote dignity and respect for people of all sexual orientations. We feel that this is not something that's appropriate. Uh, and certainly doesn't align with the values that we believe of the Grundy County here values. And uh, also, of course, a lot of teachers won't want to be teaching this stuff. Uh, then it goes on uh, another page that's finally our concerns about this. Uh, we, we feel this is the kind of stuff that should just be with parents, that it shouldn't be in, in the schools. And uh, it, it really is, it seems to be sexualization of children uh, that it seems to be doing here. So. Uh, but this whole thing about becoming advocates is just, to me, it's just incredible that they want to become advocates of this kind of lifestyle that they'll reach. So we feel, I know there's some disagreement about whether this will apply to the school district or not. Uh, we feel that the safest thing is to opt out. A, a school, if you opt out, there's no danger then. <laughs> and you say, hey, we're, we're going to opt out of these standards. You're not going to do it. Uh, then it's done. You don't have to worry about it anymore, it's done. And the, the only problem is where they get you is then you can't teach sex education. It's, it's the way you present it to you is all or nothing. You get a, you teach any kind of sex education, you have to use these standards. That's where they get you. Uh, but anyway, uh, we hope that you, is that my time? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so I hope you do consider opting out of these standards. Uh, this, this State Board of Education has to come up with a curriculum by August 1st of 2022 to implement these standards. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jeff Warren. Um, to just continue what he was saying there about the um, August 1st, 2022. Um, that deadline is uh, uh, when the, the standards, the new standards, have to be implemented. And it's um, it's not like nothing can be done, and they would just, just automatically uh, send you the curriculum, and you have to. It's going to have to be something the board's going to have to uh, discuss and vote on. And, uh, the uh, this I know that I know the district. I talked with the superintendent today uh, this morning, and I know the district teaches sex ed. Um, that class would have to be eliminated. Um, and the um, I talked to an attorney in Arlington Heights and that legally paper I passed out to so answer. I asked her the question of is it a is it a um, an either or? I mean you, you either teach the, the, the sex ed or you don't. And she said, yeah, it's back on it. So if you teach sex ed, you're gonna have to teach to these standards. I came to talk about um, a book that I read by um, Abigail Shire um, is called Irre Irreversible Damage. It's the transgender craze seducing our daughters. Um, I'm going to read some excerpts. This is, uh, this is what this stuff will lead to. In 2007, uh, America had one pediatric gender clinic. Today, there are hundreds. In the state of Washington, a 13-year-old can begin gender-affirming therapy without her parents' consent. In Oregon, a 15-year-old can get an elective double mastectomy without her parents' permission. Many children are getting puberty blockers at a very young age. In California, they can get them in their schools. Testosterone therapy is readily available to adolescents from places like Planned Parenthood and Tyson, often on the first visit without a therapist's note. These hormones begin to square the jaw and deepen the voice of, of the girls that take them. And this is after three months is irreversible. 
To understand how we got to this point, it's useful to begin by considering gender dysphoria. It's real. It's also exceedingly rare. It afflicts one one hundred percent of the population, most of whom are male. For nearly the hundred year history of scientific studies of gender dysphoria, it has been diagnosed almost exclusively in young children and mostly in boys. But over the last decade, decade, large numbers of teenage girls have begun to claim they have gender dysphoria. Prior to 2012, in fact, there was no scientific literature on gender dysphoria arising in teenage girls. Dr. Lisa Littman, then a Brown University public health researcher, used the phrase rapid onset gender dysphoria to refer to the subsequent spike in transgender identification on teenage girls. This spike is not unique to America. We see it across the Western world. To offer just one statistic, there has been an increase of 4,400% in the number of teenage girls seeking treatment in the United Kingdom's National Gender Clinic. Across the West, teen girls are now the leading demographic claiming to have gender dysphoria. These teenage girls are in a great deal of pain. Almost all of them have had some that have at some point dealt with eating disorders, engaged in self-harm, or been diagnosed with other mental health disorders. And now they're being allowed to self-diagnose gender dysphoria by a medical establishment that has given them the political pressure and decided that it's their job to affirm and agree with trans-identified adolescents. Similarly, endocrinologists, physicians, pediatricians, and researchers who are concerned about the risk of gender intervention report that they struggle to get their research published. Public and private funding of research is almost entirely restricted to researchers who promote gender transition and downplay the risks. The common thread running through these topics is that the truth is being obscured by gender ideology. Lies are being told about the risk of transition treatments administered to young children. Both to downplay the the dangers of those treatments and to exaggerate the degree by which those treatments are known to be helpful. So what, so what do we do about it? How do we push back? First and foremost, we must oppose the indoctrination of children in gender, gender ideology. There is no good reason for it, and it does real harm. We can absolutely insist that all children treat each other kindly without indoctrinating an entire generation in gender confusion. The National Education Standards cloak this gender ideology in the much needed anti bullying campaigns in our public schools. Just These issues quick, please. need to be separate. So I ask the board to opt out. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, at this point, I guess I, would, I you know, I'm going to thank both of you for your comments. Uh, this act, as we read it, requires school districts with a standalone sex education course to teach the new sex education standards. And this is currently not a problem in our district. Our district does not offer a standalone educational course because our sex education curriculum is taught within our health curriculum. And I repeat, currently this is not an issue in our district and does not impact us. We've made changes. Uh, we have made no changes in our sex education curriculum based on the PA 102 slash 0522. And we have really no current plans to do so right now. Now, if something changes, we, we are going to deal with it as a, as a board. And uh, again, we have no current changes that we need to make in our curriculum. All our curriculum is posted on our, on our website. And again, if something comes up and we currently need to make the changes, we certainly will. But as of now, we don't fall under the auspices of this law. Okay? So you're not currently teaching to that standard. I'm sorry, what? You're not currently teaching to the new standard. No, no, we are not. And you don't intend to. We'll see what happens as, as we as we will the line. You know, right now we have no. If, you know, we're not we're excluded from the law per se right now because we don't have a standalone. Just for this, if I'm allowed to come, I just say sorry. just make the mind make sure with attorneys because there's different interpretations of this. Right. Uh, and different so you know, well, one, that's, one said that you know if you teach any sex standards at all, it doesn't have to be a standalone or whatever. But that you have to comply with. But that, that, you know, that's currently where we are right now. So again, we appreciate your concerns. Okay. Um, you know, we appreciate voicing your opinions and go from there. Now, ladies, you want to go ahead? Yes. Um, mine pretty much stems off of what they are saying, along with, by the way, I'm Emily McNabb. I'm from Morris, Illinois. First of all, could you please give us your name and your Emily your McNabb from Morris, Illinois. Okay. 
Now, with the, the HB 370 that just went into effect, pretty much getting rid of parental notification, which is how you can have your 12 year old get an abortion without your consent, nobody's consent, parent consent, or you go to school counselor, school counselor can take her. This SB 18 stems also from CRT. And I have um, information from my cousin Abby that wrote, because she wanted to read it, but she wasn't able to come tonight. So I'm going to read what she wrote because she's done extensive research on this SB 818. And right now, yeah, you can't make a decision on it because it hasn't been up to dinner out yet. So the board can't really make a decision until that time comes. So she writes, I'm speaking today in regards to the Illinois SB 818 bill that was passed in past August based on the bill text. This bill is to redesign sex ed in K through 12 students. It is called Comprehensive Sexual Health Education. In this speech, I will refer to it as CSE. CSE is, in fact, a worldwide philosophy on teaching based on some, on some of the theories, guidelines, or philosophies that include ideas. In general, young people themselves are increasingly demanding their right to sexuality education, and that children are naturally sexual from birth. Therefore, any restrictions on their sexual expression or sexual activity violates their sexual rights, and children have a right to sexual information uncensored and without consent. Several of these philosophies and the beginning of the sexual education movement are spawned from a man named Alfred Kinsley. This man has promoted a lot of sexual ideas for children and has been, been known to base his so-called research off of pedophiles and their unthinkable doings. This is too much for at my mind to navigate, knowing the CSE is based off someone who would promote pedophilia and did research from pedophile prisoners. From the sounds of this education for our children and youth and the theories and philosophies that is based off of pedophilia is exactly what this promotes. And you would be teaching it in our schools with SB 818. The groups that fund CSE and essentially the basis for SB 818 that is pushing into our schools do not protect our children. Groups such as CICUS, UNICEF, Girl Scouts, WAGS, IPPF, also people such as Obama, Mary Caldron, who also follows Kinsley, and Kinsley Institute for Research in Sex, Gender, and Reproduction in Indiana. Rather, they promote sexual behavior focusing on pleasure and all ranges in open sexual relationships. They are working hard to ensure they teach our children that it is okay to be sexual in nature and that it is okay to experiment, just be safe. That is the pedophilia way to encourage children of any age to be engaged sexually in sexual conversations, look to their peers for support and that need the parental knowledge concerning pregnancy and sexual problems is essentially not required. It's completely incompetent and irresponsible of anyone who teaches it. The attempt to obstruct the true contents of this education is by calling it healthy sexuality education. Instead of the normal sex education with puberty in fifth grade, anatomy, psychology, reproduction, and STDs in eighth grade and high school, it carries on to include teaching young children about finding their identity, gender equality, pleasure, and promoting sexual freedom, oral and anal sex, and to change the traditional views. Psychists even go as far as to call President Trump's efforts to promote abstinence until married ineffective, shaming, harmful, and wildly unpopular. The people and groups advocate and financially support the sexualization of our youth and even go as far as to say their findings of strong sexuality of a newborn. In a book written by Calderon, she said, children are sexual and think sexual thoughts and do sexual things. If these statements do not say something strong to you about CSE, please step back and reevaluate what your state has just passed as an actual bill for schools and children as young as five in kindergarten. Europe has gone so far as to include zero to four year olds in their standards, stating that children's sexual development starting at birth and babies focus entirely on these senses, touching, listening, looking, tasting, and smelling. Cuddling and caressing your baby is very important as this lays the foundation for his or her healthy social and emotional development. This has nothing to do with sexuality. In no way should anything related to babies be sexual in nature, and in no way should anything that has even the slightest basis of this type of sexualization of our youth be considered being taught at any level of schooling. It is going worldwide. The last statement for the zero to four year olds is in the curricula that was supported by some of the same supporters of the US standards. Traditional teachings are not broken and should be left alone. It is only broken according to the one that supports the agenda for sexualizing our youth and promoting rights 
of folks who are confused and the continuing influx of funds from the sources given to these young children for the access of men's birth control, PREP, PDP, other forms of contraceptives. These are all 100% adult matters, and that is a fact. Several supporters of CSE are activists for LGBTQ groups that is being glamorized already to teens in every aspect of the internet. Social media, school clubs, and bright colors, positive thoughts, being free, being yourself, lots of friends. Ma'am, please wrap up. Okay. Equality, respect to lure them in. But in reality, this is all promotion of sex. All of it promotes sex, and it is all based of, based on who puts, puts what where. And the fact is, all of it, period, that is where it stems from. Sorry. And I do have a copy of this for you that she wrote with all the sources. Ma'am, do you have anything you want to say? Just that I think it's ridiculous that we've been voting something in on special interest groups when we took religion out of school, because that was a special interest group that you can put this kind of stuff back in. It's ridiculous. Okay. Uh, again, I thank you all for your comments. Um, right now, this doesn't affect our district, and if something changes, we will certainly deal with it as it comes down the as it comes down the line. Right. Okay. Thank you for your time. Okay, let's go ahead and move on with our meeting. Thank you. Are there any other items or there any items that the board would like to remove from the consent agenda? Anything you need to remove? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, then I will need a first and second motion to approve the consent agenda in two minutes and the closed session minutes is a regular meeting of October 6th. September activity funds reports, September treasures report, October monthly manual checks report, October payrolls. November accounts payable, personnel items including approval of employments, transfers, leave requests, and to approve the following building usage requests as listed. Chuck so oh, sorry. Quint so moves and Sean seconds. Roll call, please, Wanda. Quint Harvey. Yes. Sean Hamilton. Yes. Robert Bianfetta. Yes. Mary Gill. Mm -hmm. Chuck Landon. Yes. Tim yes. Any questions about the administrative report? Chris, or anything you want to put on yours? Mm -hmm. um, okay. That's fine. Okay. Any questions about those? Okay, special population report. Luke, anything? I uh, just wanted to add uh, that since um, I submitted my report on Thursday morning, uh, we're now expecting four more students with IEPs coming into the district in the next couple weeks. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah, the Yeah, kind of choice. Where are they? And what's I always ask, Luke? Um, do you know the circumstances yeah, where they're coming from? There's a family of three coming from Reed Custer. And uh, another family um, from uh, Joliet. All right. Let's move on. Yeah, Tammy, anything you got? I just want to highlight the Illinois School Report Card Round One is out. Uh, there will be two more releases of the Illinois School Report Card as uh, more data becomes available. I can talk more specifically about it later, but um, the, the school report card is out right now. There really isn't uh, a lot there. It's attendance and uh, retention and, and uh, some very minor things. Uh, so I just want to make you aware that that's why we're not talking about it. There's not a lot to talk about yet. So we're done. Okay. Any questions, Tim? <clears throat> okay, Chris. All right. Yes. Uh, with, with Dr. Bunch's report, just uh, a couple highlights. Um, of course, there's a couple of FOIA requests that have been taken care of, but one thing I wanted to just talk about was that uh, Morris Hospital acquired resin orthopedics uh, and sports medicine, um, and resin is who's uh, provided us with our athletic trainers over the past few years. Um, that the agreement is transferred right over to Morris Hospital, so we're not losing anything. Um, we do appreciate all that they've done. Um, they continue to do a great job. Uh, so there's no change of the contract. There's no change of the people that we're dealing with, but just that we're going to make sure you guys are aware that uh, Morris Hospital did purchase residents. So I'm very happy with, like I said, the, the job that they do and, and, and how things have moved over. You would notice that it happened in So just making the board aware of that. Okay. Um, really, that's, uh, that's all I have. Okay. All right. Going to your vocational center report. Chuck, anything? Yeah. We're going to have an LLT meeting there tomorrow and they're going to take us on a tour. So yeah. that's kind of cool. Cool. There. Okay. Any questions about the athletic director's report? Any communication from the floor in regard to agenda items or anything in general? And with that said, then let's move on to old business. 
Uh, Jason, you want to discuss the rental proposal for the farm's property on Spring and Berta? So that affectionately is referred to as the Swanson property. Um, that has been under cash rent lease for the last decade or so. The last time the, the lease came available, the board extended that with the current tenant farmer. Um, this time we um, we had some other individuals that, that sought interest in that uh, RFP process going out on the street. And so that is currently out. Um, the individuals who requested it have a copy of the, the uh, request for proposal. It's also been posted with the um, FSA for Grundy County and the Farm Bureau for Grundy County. Um, and if we had a farm and fleet, it'd be on the bulletin board in the lobby, but we don't. So, um, but that is out there. And I just wanted to let the board know that it is out on the street currently. We'll come back at the December meeting to do the award. The agreement with the current uh, tenant farmer uh, ends in February. The reason we do it at this time of year is so that they can get equipment funding seed in place, et cetera, so that they can be successful in the spring when planting comes about. So um, there's no action that's on this tonight. I simply, we did have a study session for me to inform the board about this prior to going out. So just wanted to inform the board. Okay. Any questions, Jason? All right. Thanks, Jake. Okay, anything about the GE mentioned on this? Yeah, just a quick update on that. Uh, at the, if you remember at the October board meeting, the board took action authorizing Whitlaw to file an assessment complaint in regards to the GE Hitachi Morris Operations Plan. Um, as a quick reminder, the assessor's office did not office did not change the value of the GE plan. Um, and we believe there should be a significant increase in that. And so Stu Rich Law has uh, filed that assessment complaint with the counter county assessor's office. Um, one thing we don't expect anything uh, review hearing until late December, maybe even early January. So I just wanted to give everybody that update on kind of where we're at with that right now. But uh, Steve Austin has uh, go ahead, went ahead and, and made that file uh, complaint for us. Okay. Any questions about that? Okay, let's move on to new business then. Integrate a first and second motion to approve the filing of the quarterly dropout report, regional office of education for the quarter ending October 15th. 2021. Chuck so moves and Bob seconds. You can happen at this time. This thing we do every quarter. Roll call, please, Wanda. Chuck Lander. Yes. Robert Bianchetta. Yes. Mary Gill. Yes. John Hamilton. Yes. Mike Harmon. Yes. And no. Yes. Entertain a first and second motion to approve to adapt the tentative 2021 property tax levy from the Full City Community Unit District Number One. And so moves second. and Sean seconds. Jay, go ahead. Um, Board members on your tables, you have a piece of paper that's um, blue out color, and on it, it outlines where the the, um, the tentative levy as it stands tonight. Earlier in the week, uh, Mr. Spencer, Dr. Bug, myself, Mr. Harmon, and Mr. Hamilton uh, had a conversation about the uh, the issues that are at play in this levy cycle. Um, that built the model that you see um, before you. Right now, this is what we would recommend that the board accepts as the tentative levy. Um, we are expecting information over the course of the month of November to change with respect to some of the items that we've already discussed earlier in the meeting. And should um, any of those assessed evaluations change in that time frame uh, or we gain any new information, we will make the necessary modifications um, so that at the December meeting um, at final levy, um, those items will be in place. But as, as it stands now and the information that we have, this is what uh, we are recommending for uh, the tenant levy. And certainly I would entertain any questions. Anybody have any questions about the levy? It's all right there in front of you. Okay, roll call vote, please, Rwanda. Quinn Harmon. Yes. Sean Hamilton. Yes. Robert Bianchetta. Yes. Mary Gill. Yes. Chuck Landon. Yes. Yes. Okay, Mr. Spencer, you want to? Talk about the overnight trips? Yes, just a um, quick discussion on the overnight trips. Um, I contacted uh, everybody last week. We were fortunate enough to have uh, right, so two weeks ago, um, students qualify for the uh, state tennis match. And they did very well, actually, two and two. Um, we're going to bring them in in December. They were able to make it tonight. So that's over bringing them in December to recognize them. But um, it was pretty much important that they stayed the night over. And in that place where the, the state tournament was held. So uh, I think it's something that when COVID hit, the COVID pandemic hit, we kind of held back on overnight stays um, just for the safety of our, our students and our, our staff. 
but um, it might be something we need to look at again and, and possibly think back to allowing those. Um, we will have a couple wrestling uh, meets coming up here in December that they do requ require overnight stays that uh, we'd have to ask the board for approval for. But um, so we're, we're thinking that it might be something we need to, to reevaluate and look at again. Um, if the board's okay with it, we put on the December agenda and uh, have a vote just to make it official uh, that way. So um, again, there could be the wrestling, there could be some co-curricular and extra other extracurricular activities that could be possibly needing to stay overnight because of where it's at, location, and timing of, of the events. For example, the tennis event, they had to pick up the, the packet uh, to post it by 7.15. So in the morning, it was a good wall and the traffic is on how you get there. So, um, so just wanted to see what the board's thoughts were on that. Um, currently, I did check with our conference schools. Um, of the eight, uh, one did not respond to me, but there were two of us that were not allowing them. The rest of them were just kind of did a quick poll of, of the conference schools. So as you can see, we're kind of in the minority right now, but um, I think everybody's kind of addressing this as it's coming up. And uh, we're to that point where it has been brought to, brought to our attention, and we need to, to look at that and kind of try to make a decision on that. So we'd be glad to entertain any questions. Hey, anybody have any questions? Yeah. Do we, do we have, um, I really don't know, Chris, and I remember the discussion pre COVID. Do we have board policy that talk that, that, or is this just kind of like, I know that we approve all overnight trips, but is there actually something in a policy or is it just a, a practice thing? That I believe it's more of a practice, but I just have to double check that. I don't, okay. I don't think, I don't recall. See, I don't remember that either. I just kind of, I remember the, I shouldn't say remember, I just, the practice, because it's, it's usually the same teams or the same yes. groups that are in the same tournaments or same games or... I can remember or, one year we went to the football team on Quincy Notre Dame and we stayed overnight. That's right. the only time I ever remember an overnight trip to a football right. but I remember that. I, I think probably the concern might be supervision. Um, you know, we probably need to have a real good plan for supervision. And you might want to check with the other schools and see what they do, Chris. Yeah, yeah, you know, let's let's we, get an idea. Yeah, we, and I know that we... we the district did it for years. We just put a pause to it because of all the COVID uncertainty. Right. You know, so now right. that that's now that, that uncertainty is is waning, um, get some of those things back, back sure. started, if you will. You know, so if somebody else does something that we might want to copy, right. why why reinvent the wheel? It, it's and basically it's wrestling that's been traveling, that's been the travel, right? And it's pretty much the same. It is yeah. Yeah. um yeah. could have some other ones. Yeah, like that. I think baseball and softball sometimes does stuff in the spring. So baseball did become in the spring, yeah. Did oh yeah, because they, they take a yeah. trip. Yeah, that, you're right. It yeah. went down to Ohio. Yeah. Yeah. Like during um spring break, they went yeah. down there just yeah. to get yeah. something. Yeah. 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 What is that also um oh you know like the the music group at the high school does a trip and there's like the I DC it, trip at the they, middle school every year. So it's all that still yes, all that there's different stuff. there's quite a few different groups that do would like to do overnight trips. I mean, our speech, there's, um, they do uh, competitions for uh, cheerleading sometimes, maybe too. So, because there are two day events and sometimes they're down in central Illinois, right. Southern right. Illinois. So, right. are different activities okay. yeah. that, that do. Oh, well, yeah, it'd be good to revisit that. Yeah, sure. They definitely can check with this uh, yeah. conference. Please, yeah, if you would, just see, yeah. what they, you know, see what they do. Like I said, we don't, <laughs> we don't have to reinvent the wheel. <laughs> yep. we, we can come back and revisit that then later. Okay, everybody set to move on then? Yep. All right, then I will entertain a first and second motion for the Board of Education to adopt a budget calendar as presented and appoint the superintendent, the chief school business official, and the building principals to prepare and tentative form the school district budget, fiscal year beginning July 1st, 2022, and ending June 30th, 2023. Chuck so moves. Quint seconds. Anything, Jay? So this is a standard course of business for the board. We've done this for ever. It just simply outlines what the benchmarks are in the finance and levy budget cycle. Okay. Roll call, please, Lawanda. Yes. 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 Jay, anything you want to mention about that? So back in the in February of 2021, uh, TRS um, made these changes, and it was suggested that boards of education adopt this resolution, which is a standard resolution um, for participation. Uh, we had a lot of feedback from legal um, since the kind of March timeframe, um, and they their recommendations that. Uh, boards kind of hold off on doing this until we had some more information. Uh, more information has been released. They're ready to spin the program up. I uh, did get confirmation from uh, legal that it was okay to 
to for the board to adopt this resolution, which is why it's um, in front of you tonight. All I can say is keep those funds coming. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Any questions of Jay on that then? All right, roll call, please. Go on. Yes. 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 Any items not on the agenda time or any communication from the floor or anything in general? Hearing none, then at 6 35, I'll entertain a first and second motion to the closed session for the purpose of considering information regarding the appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, dismissal of specific employees, and collective bargaining matters. Chuck so moves. Do I have a second? I'll second. All right, Sean seconds. <laughs> Roll call, please, Lord. Yes. John Hamilton? Yes. Sean Hamilton? Yes. Sean Hamilton? Yes. Sean Hamilton? Yes. Sean Hamilton? Yes. S